name's Tim Campbell, Board Advisor to Humanic, and I'm here with the wonderful Chloe James, who is Group Media and PR Director at RFI Group. We're going to have a fantastic conversation. Hi, Chloe. How are you? I'm great, Tim. Thank you very much for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you for giving up the time. I believe you're, be you're between stops. I am between stops. I travel all over the mm. world. I'm based in Sydney, as you can probably hear by my accent. By your lovely dulcet tones. G'day. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but I spend a lot of time in London. I spend a lot of time in Singapore. Yep. RFI group, as you mentioned. Yep. Uh, we're based in uh, offices all over the world. Mm -hmm. So Sydney, Melbourne, London, Singapore, Dubai, Toronto, San Francisco. Wow. Ooh, so your air miles are up there, yes? Yeah, yeah. So I travel <laughs> a lot. We operate in 44 markets around the world. So I do a lot of travel mm -hmm. for that. So always on a plane, but get to obviously meet amazing people all over the world because of that. Well, it's my turn now. I get to meet you. you this, is, this must be quite weird, this bit of a role reversal for you. Yeah, yeah, it's the interview, the interviewer. So yeah. Yeah, it's quite, it's, that's different for me. Quite, um, that's going to make a noise. Um, it's quite different for me, but I don't know, I quite like it. I kind of like being on the other side of things just because it gets, I can see how you run. <laughs> well, you could give me a, a mark out of 10 when we get to the end okay, of the interview. Okay, all right, interview, yeah, right? I'll keep that's that in mind. So, you travel all around. Where's your favourite destination? Favourite destination? I love London. Mm. I have to Why? say, I think London is really is the centre of the world at the moment. And if we're talking about, I know we're talking about financial inclusion and diversity, but talking about fintech, which is an area that I work in really heavily, I just think there's so many amazing things happening out of London, mm. coming out of the crisis, you know, some eight years ago. It was one of the worst affected and as true Londoners do, you know, that grit, dig mm -hmm. deep and let's be better than ever before. I think it's just got a vibrancy, a diversity. I love it every time I'm on the tube here, I always make a conscious effort to look around that carriage mm -hmm. and I just love that you see, you know, every race, every gender, every ethnicity, every religion, every sex, every preference and I just, in one little one carriage little and they're all working and living together sort of co-harmoniously which is just, you know, it's amazing. We, we are very fortunate. There, there are obviously undercurrents of um, dis disadvantage for lots of people and that's quite mm. difficult but you're right, there is the ability to work, to be who you are in a city centre like London is fantastic. But you, you are one of the people that I really respect in terms of you are able to talk to some of these business leaders and get right to the heart of the issue. Tell me about some of the most interesting people that you've had a conversation with. Oh, I've, I've spoken with some really amazing people and just most recently actually, so I just emceed at Money 2020 in mm -hmm. Copenhagen, which mm -hmm. is a huge Global Fintech Conference, it was the European version. They do one in Vegas, which is just off the charts, American <laughs> wild. It's pretty yep. fun, I'm going there in October. And um, yep. they do one in Singapore and they do a European one. So 6,000 delegates, like 500 businesses, just absolutely huge. So I emceed a day that was based around financial inclusion there. And then yep. I also had the privilege to interview 18 of the keynotes on day one. That's a long day of interviewing. That was 10 until seven literally non-stop, probably wow. like this, in, out, in, out. And um, and I just met with some really amazing people. I met with Rita Liu, who is the head of uh, financial services for Alipay. Mm -hmm. Amazing woman. I mean, Alipay statistics, I don't know how aware you Off are, but chain. 400 million, you know, consumers, 100 million billion transactions a yeah. day, just absolutely off the chart. So Rita was incredible. A guy called Josh Bottomley, who's mm -hmm. the head of, global head of digital for HSBC, globally, and he's ex-Google, so he was really interesting to talk about how a lot of these big sort of technology, amazing technology heads are coming into traditional financial services organisations, sort of changing them around a bit. Mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting. I spoke to the C, the head of financial services for Uber, easily, you know, the most amazing fintech that's come out in the last few years. Those I know some interesting changes at the moment. Interesting changes mm -hmm. at the moment, and, and there's an interesting point, I guess we could segue there onto diversity because of the huge issues that they've kind of been having in diversity and sexism, and actually yeah. well, I was talking about this on a podcast yesterday, really interesting and quite terrible statistics that have come out of that, but obviously Travis has stepped aside for the time being and they're mm -hmm. looking at having a female CEO come in. I think it's actually going to be the ex-Yahoo uh, so, CEO, yeah. so Marissa Mayer, I yeah. think her name is. Yeah. Um, but then you, you in the same instance, you talk about fintech, you have Rita, who is doing some phenomenal things. Yeah. And, and she's lovely, by the way. Well, yeah. I, I don't doubt that. But in terms of a, as a business leader, she, mm. she's phenomenal. And mm. I think being in charge of such a, a, a transformational business as well, mm. with the numbers that are associated, there are some amazing... But is there enough female leaders in, within the fintech industry, in your, in your opinion? <laughs> 
No, it's the easy answer to that. I think that there can always be more, like until we're at 50-50. I read a quote recently and someone said, until women and men are sort of 50-50 in leadership positions, it was Natalie Portman who mm -hmm. said it, of all people, of all people, we will still be serving. Yep. And I thought that was a really interesting quote. So no, there aren't enough. There are some really strong female leaders out there. I think it's really important for women actually. I think we have to take a responsibility to step up. It's one of the mm -hmm. reasons that I do things like this. Mm -hmm. um, I take it upon myself, you know, there's a there's a, a hashtag, if she can, I can, yep. that I actually put onto the end of every single um, quote I have. That's from a mentor of mine, a woman called Jo Burston, who's an incredible Australian entrepreneur. She has a global organisation called Inspiring Rare Birds, yep. and it's about entrepreneurship for women, um, and to have, you know, uh, I think it's one million new female entrepreneurs by, I think it's next year actually. Okay. So anyway, that's just a really organisation just for people to have a look at. Mm. Um, there certainly can be more women in leadership positions. I write a women in leadership series Seriously. for the Global Retail Banker that I'm the editor of. Have about a thousand jobs. <laughs> um, well, you find a time. But it's amazing. Like I speak to really interesting women in banking and financial services about what it takes to get to the top. And and I guess it. I mean, do you want some? Do you I want do. advice I on do. Some, like you know, it, it's I, some of them are like the classics of you know you. You know, don't wait to get tapped on the shoulder. Just put your hand up, throw your hat into the ring. I'll throw my hat into the ring for anything. Yep. Like I'm kind of like the yes woman. Yeah. I don't say girl there. That's deliberate. Like yes woman. You know, just just say. You know, just try it. Fake it till you make it. In some cases, I think. Well, why not? And then I think it's that sort of if she can, I can. I really love that because it's. I hope if anything, I hope that I could potentially inspire just like lots of women who mm. I've kind of looked at throughout business mm. can inspire other women to kind of go that next mile. One of the, the best CEOs of um, Westpac Bank in Australia, one of the big four, yep. I guess, which, you know, I'm obviously Australian, was Gail Kelly. And, yep. you know, she was such a strong woman, so inspiring to see her at the top there. Yep. And I think it's so important for women to be in those positions. It's great to see some, not that they're all doing so well at the moment, but some political figures being, yep. you know, women at the moment in those um, positions sport like across you go across industry it's really important just to have that diversity i think and i'm but incredibly is, passionate about but it. is it enough because essentially lots of the conversations and keep me straight on this mm. can sometimes feel that it's women talking to other women and i'm a great supporter of the he for she campaign mm. which is much more around finding enlightened men who whether you like it or not there are lots of men in those influential positions of power who sometimes need to be educated yeah. in a slightly different way so do we need to do more about getting the two parties to talk together? Absolutely, absolutely. And there are some, I have to say, you know, I, I said like I always will put my sort of hand up and go to these things. I have a bit of an issue going to sort of a women's event, talking to women about women with only women there. Like, I mean, you know, I just, it needs to be, you need, we have, I think it's probably quite similar to the thing that you're talking about, but we have male champions of change in yep. Australia. And that's yep. very um, sort of prevalent. Some of the biggest organisations in Australia have sort of mandates that they've put on them that they will say that, that at, from board, well, sorry, leadership position onwards or board level, it has to be 50-50. Yep. RFI group, great example, the business I work for, 10 years old, my CEO, Charles Green, he started the business on the Exco, which I'm on. So yep. the leadership team is 50-50. Like, yep. I think five, four, four men, four women, um, and he's very, uh, and you know, we all bring different diversity. There's so many studies that show, and actually, especially in, in startup culture and things like that, that, you know, businesses with women in leadership positions will do better. Yeah. It's factual, like yep. it's fact. It's, Return I was, on capital, everything else. I exactly. was talking to these guys from this FinTech Insider podcast that I was on yesterday exactly mm. about this. And another interesting conversation we had is that the stats coming out of Silicon Valley at the moment are that there's still a massive issue there. There's a mm. massive issue with sort of this sexism issue and women in tech being treated differently, like kind of pulling things. So it's kind of like, and we had a really interesting conversation there about, you know, there's kind of like the older generation of men and I'm not gonna sit here and say like, you kind of get it, but it's almost like our grandparents yeah. have certain views. Mine personally don't, but I actually can understand from that, you know, it's a long time ago and so mm. much history had happened and they might have certain views that if you're educated now you wouldn't but and so it's never okay but I can kind of understand why some older men don't know that it's different. okay and then it's that conversation of like do you call someone out on it do you mm. say hey that's not appropriate and, and that's what I've been told because like I've had situations where you know I've had inappropriate situations and been yeah. really uncomfortable and you know it's it's not fair quite frankly and and it's really hard to know whether to go to call them out, like look at look an older man or whoever, whatever, a man straight in the eye and just be like, this is so out of line. Because yeah. they could just turn around and go, oh, Chloe, who do you think you are? So mm. it's, it's kind of scary. Mm. Um, I reckon I'm sort of like getting to the point where I might have the confidence to do that. I'm mm. 35. Mm. Worries me that obviously younger women might not 
be no, able to do that. But sense. anyway, sorry, the conversation that we're having about Silicon Valley, which is it's a real shame, but they're kind of going and poaching these like young tech kids, really super smart kids from Ivy League schools who probably didn't always do amazingly with the ladies mm. when they were at college, mm. putting them on these kick-ass salaries. salaries yeah. They come into Silicon Valley, think they're just all that. And gift. it's ego, right? Yep. It's ego driven. And yep. you know, can you not, not can you blame a 19 year old guy and people are educated and they should behave differently, but it's mm. certainly setting them up with all the tools to perhaps be a tool. I don't no, know no, why you, 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 you know what I mean? But you, you take the, you, you already had the analogy around sport. You look at lots of our sports stars who are paid extortionate salaries yeah. and then the implications of what some of their actions afterward because they live in this bubble. And I suppose I have, have a personal view that you can't ever excuse anyone's behaviour because actually you have a choice around what you do. Yeah. But I think if we have more empowered women who feel confident enough to stand up yeah. and check those balances and then educate the men at the same time, mm. that they shouldn't be conducting them. So that that's got to create a better platform. I think, yeah, bringing them together. And I also think it's important that, you know, and I said this on the podcast yesterday, the FinTech Insider one, it's good now that there are platforms and people are actually speaking and yeah. saying, this yeah. happened to me, yeah. even better when they put their name to it sad that some people are like anonymous I don't mm -hmm. want to say but you mm -hmm. kind of can understand that but yeah sorry to your point Tim absolutely it's a male and female conversation you need the male champions of change it's silly to sit there and go think you know so it's so short-sighted to think oh men don't understand they could never be involved mm -hmm. in that like how many men have daughters my dad oh, has three daughters my dad has three daughters and a yeah. wife and he is you know um I would say a feminist, you know, yeah. because he obviously has taught us to, well, he's taught us to sort of all be pretty, you know, strong and it's fight for what we want. And and I think, I don't know, I, I've had like kind of bad situations sort of happen, but I've also had some like great situations mm -hmm. happen. And I think sometimes as well, there's that whole unconscious bias and sometimes Honestly, sometimes men just don't even know that what they're doing mm. is inappropriate yeah. at a certain level. And if you don't tell them, then maybe they won't. Well, well, no. So maybe just say it. And I mean, there's probably a case for just saying it and they could just, they might at the time think, oh, that felt a bit harsh. Mm. And then maybe go away, mm. go for their, you know, run around the park <laughs> and think, yeah, I was a bit out of line actually. Yeah, uh, we, we never great with rejection, but I think sometimes you do have to check, check that. <laughs> no man. one's good with rejection. No, no brilliant. I'll, 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 I've got lots of experience. But anyway, yeah. so, so <laughs> yeah, the reality is I think my, my changing point was actually having a daughter. It, it, completely oh. revolutionises the way you think and, and look at certain situations. But not everyone's in that position. Mm -hmm. I want to take you back, though, Chloe, to mm -hmm. where did you start? Give us a give us a feel. What did you study? What did, what did study? I study? Okay, so I studied performing arts. Mm -hmm. I went to a drama mm -hmm. school in Australia, mm -hmm. um, a very, it's called the Drama Centre, quite mm -hmm. an exclusive school, quite yep. challenging to get into. Yep. Didn't think I was going to get in, but I did. Thank you. <laughs> so I was, yeah, I was young. I was 17. I yep. was the youngest person in the year. It's 12 mm -hmm. people for four years. Wow. Um, so it's it's an honours degree. Yeah. Um, and what was yeah. the vision? What did you want to be an actress? Okay. I was going to be Nicole Kidman, basically. Look at you. Yeah. Yes. So I am from Adelaide, yeah. South Australia, which mm. is a probably the smallest. I think it's the smallest um, city in Australia. Mm. A million people. Mm. Small town. Grew up on a farm. Yeah. With horses, pigs, cows, the sheep, whole everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I always went to that drama school. I moved up to the up to Sydney. Got an agent, and was sort of acting in you know. Um, sort of you know, random dramas that you probably know, um, and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, theatre mm. theatre work, and yep. then working in a bar because that's what you do when you're an actress. When you're waiting for the gig, pulling beers, and I just <laughs> was like, I was doing that for a couple of years. And to be fair, I always say I didn't actually deserve to make it. You hear about Naomi Watts like fighting it out for mm, 12 mm, years mm, before mm, she mm. even got a look in. So yeah. I actually, I'll put my hands up and say I didn't fight for long enough. Yeah. But ended up randomly um, sort of getting a role within. Actually, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission. Mm. The good joke here is that it was ASIC from the um, like the initial is obviously yeah, ASIC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was the sneakers. Sneakers. <laughs> I'm actually not joking. That is actually a true story. And I said to my boyfriend at the time, I was like, "Cool, I've got this like EA temp role at ASIC." And he's like, "You know, that's the Australian Securities and Investments Commission." I was like, "You're thinking I'm getting freebie trainers?" I'm like, like "Yeah, <laughs> I, that's actually what I thought." It's embarrassing but true and how funny hey, oh, like listen, I got we'll, to, I was just gonna tell you we'll that. But so I was doing that and then and then I did a big a sort of a big um, I was in communications mm. and international affairs, just randomly worked my way up and then I met a really interesting guy from the Financial Services Authority in London and yep. I said, you know, I really want to come over to London. My parents mm. are both British, that's our entire heritage mm -hmm. and background, mm -hmm. and so I moved to London and then worked at the FSA in May of 2008, so yeah. you do the maths, yeah. two months yeah. later, poof, crash. 
Gone. Yeah, and my little cousin Sam. You were, had, in, you were in Canary Wharf. I was in Canary yeah. Wharf. Yeah, my little cousin Sam had just started his internship at Lehman Brothers, and he texted me and said, oh "Hey, gosh. they're not letting us back in." I was like, "Yeah, I don't think you're going to be yeah, going you back in there." Yeah. So anyway, so that was that was kind of the history, and then I was in sort of banking and finance. I was in L London for about three and a half years. Went mm. back to Australia, um, still in banking. Then then I got the call up from RFI Group, and mm. they'd approached me, and I said I wasn't really looking, and they said, "No, no, you should meet this guy, Charles mm. Green. He's incredible." And started working for Charles and then I started doing, um, I did like my own kind of website show and yep. then Sky News saw it and yep. asked me to come in and screen test and then I started working for Sky News. Sky News as well. So now I do both and I absolutely love it. Mm. My show is um, business success, so entrepreneurs, I talk to business owners and entrepreneurs about mm. what it takes to create a successful business. So, you know, onto meeting amazing people. I talk yep. to amazing people all day, every day about the mm. incredible change and sort of things that they're doing within business and it's hugely inspiring. Well, it's amazing because you've been able to actually couple your passion because when you talk yeah. about the performing, your eyes light up. Yeah. But oh. then <laughs> you think, and you think, oh my gosh, you didn't, we're going to pursue your dream. But the reality is that you are living your dream. I know. You're but still doing it. It's life, it's weird, mm -hmm. right? Like I, it, it's weird, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of come full circle, full circle. Which is weird, but I, but I, you know, I'm an expert in my field now yeah. and I really yeah. love that I'm, Presenting, and I, I love that I am um, giving a platform to, for people to talk about what they love, their yeah. passion. You know, this is like everything they live yeah. and breathe and die for, like yeah. blood, sweat, and tears as a business owner or an entrepreneur. You know, they always say, don't do it for the money. Mm. You have to love what you do. And mm. it's like, I'm inspired by talking to these yeah. people. And yeah. Well, if you, you get to see that little window into their world. Yeah. But then you amplify it to so lots of other people can see it as well. Yeah. So with regards to RFI, what's your role and what's your responsibility? So role at RFI, so the group media and PR director. So looking after public relations for the for the whole business mm -hmm. um, across the globe. Mm -hmm. So, so I, sh I probably should go back. We're a global business intelligence and digital media provider focusing exclusively on financial services. So mm -hmm. essentially, we are a market research provider for the banks operating in 44 markets around the world. Talk to over half a million consumers every year about their relationship with their banking products. Yeah. And then banks subscribe to our syndicated research programs and we then feed that back to them. So, you know, um, NatWest, this is what your customers are saying about you, yeah. Barclays, whoever, HSBC, globally, yeah. all over the world. Um, and then we then help drive their strategy, which is really interesting in banking at the moment because there's so much so competition much. Yeah. The challenger mean, in this banks. country alone. Yeah. Like challenger banks, fintechs, you know, firstly they were kind of like this like little threat. Now mm. they're, and, then, they, and then they were partnering and now they're like, actually, I'm just going to leapfrog you. Correct, yeah. So it's a really interesting space to work in. So essentially um, we, we run... Do you think they can compete? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we look at, I mean, some of the statistics we look at, um, I think it's gone up from 60 to 80% of consumers, like a 20% jump in the last 12 months of consumers globally who would consider a digital only provider. Mm -hmm. So literally on your mobile phone mm -hmm. or your tablet, you do not need a branch. Millennials will, will go into a banking app 92 times as opposed to sort of walking into a branch like three yep. times a year or whatever yep. um, in, in, you know, a very short period of time. Um, so if you look at if you look at sort of fintech adoption, something else that's quite interesting in fintech is um, from the Australian perspective alone. So it's got it's it's a, a zero to five percent increase in the last twelve months. Now contactless, you know when yep. contactless came in, yep. that was zero to five percent in twelve months. Five years later, it's at seventy percent saturation. So if you look at the same, it's exactly same, the same, same, right? That's fintech. So fintech is where it's at and that's yeah. why I think London is probably the most exciting place to be. I was at that we work space yes, in Allgate yeah, yesterday yeah. and just some of the businesses that the are coming out of there. The there is amazing isn't it? Awesome like I want to yeah. work in that office yeah. space it was really cool and like you know young guns and we're talking about you know people going into a business um, you know imagine going for a job interview at maybe a more traditional provider mm. and then going into if you're a grad or going mm. into an interview at a we work or mm. a stone and chalk or mm. a whatever like whatever fintech hub around the world mm. pretty appealing it really to is. be I in that space th there's a huge pressure then on the education policies from lots of the countries around the world True. because how do you encourage somebody to go down a pathway which is ultimately going to lead to university the mm. ones that we both went through mm. when actually some people are seeing their role models the new rock stars of mm. today say well they dropped out of this they did this mm. and they started a little thing at some or equivalent and they're off floating on some form of market or doing an ico now as yeah. it is and they're out there making millions yeah. how, how do you how do you keep focused and maybe i'm stealing some advice from my daughter here yeah. but how do you keep the the next generation of millennials to be focus on the power of education when there's all of this excitement around fintech? I think, I actually think because of social media and platforms and accessibility to education and literacy, mm. 
I actually think millennials are incredibly well educated. Mm. Um, some of the brightest people that I've had conversations with, you know, mm. they're in their early twenties and they've like started a, started a business. They're really they're really smart. They're very and I, this is what I really love about this whole financial inclusion piece and diversity is they're they're really sort of savvy. They're really socially conscious. Mm. Like you know, everyone's got a funding page for something, and it's about social change and social good for you know inclusion changing people's lives yep. you know bringing in the unbanked you know in the world two billion people in the world are yep. unbanked and yep. um, some of the statistics all around the world so i actually love that the millennials in this education piece it's almost like i actually think it's almost like the education system needs to change somewhat to bring in more of these types of i don't know this type of curriculum yeah maybe yeah, as a, and, and as a make it more relevant to what's actually out there in the market. Of what, what jobs are out there? Because that's a that's a big problem, right? Unemployment. Mm -hmm. People are going to university. I know that from my cousins who are who are all British and they went to university, studied fantastic degrees, came mm -hmm. out, and it was like, well, there's no jobs. Yeah, what do we do? So it's tough. But 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 because but the, you look at the, India, India has got MBA students yeah. who are in call centres. It's yeah, that's yeah, that's bad. So maybe if it maybe the education curriculum and system needs to needs to shift and move and change somewhat to meet. What the yeah? What the new um, employment landscape Correct. looks uh, like? It's, 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 I don't know what I would tell them. I don't have children yet. Mm -hmm. I would I, I would love children, um, but I don't know what I would um, encourage them to do. But I, I'd encourage them to sort of keep an open mind. And and it's I mean the traditional obviously there's going to be traditional jobs still there. It's always going to be doctors and lawyers and yep. teachers and um, you know very you know everything's important. But there are also so many other options and choices, which is quite exciting. Mm. You could you can like just look at the positive spin it on it. I think mm. I'm an optimist, so oh, I uh, tend to do that anyway. The but two of us will be happy forever. <laughs> yeah. don't you? but you're, you're right. But I suppose when you speak to some of these business leaders, is that is social awareness and, and consciousness at the forefront of their mind or is, there, is it all around shareholder value? I think, what do I think about that? I think it's becoming more and more important to them. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether that's driven by because they have to be or because deep in their hearts they want to be. Yeah. But does that matter? Like as long as they're doing it. The and I think that they are driven by the, you know, the younger blood and fresher blood coming into the organisation will almost demand it. So yes. I've read some studies recently. I don't know the statistics or anything of it, but I know that it was all about, you know, millennials nowadays will look at, when they sort of look at a job spec and look at a company to work for, they really care about, you know, the charity work that they'll get yeah. a chance to do, you know, what the company gives back, how sustainable is it. Yeah. Um, they, they care about those things and they mm. will pick a company over another company based on, based on some of those. Mm. That's great. And I mean, they're the next CEOs anyway. Mm. So if they end up changing the sort of, um, you know, structure of the business, then mm. that's great. I, I, but you're, you're speaking to some true trailblazers and mm. actually some organisations that have true power to change things. Mm. Are they moving quickly enough? Could they be doing more? Uh, I, th I think I agree with you and I, and I do work with all of these people. I think business for good is becoming more and more important. Can they do more? Yes. But is it a challenging time? Yes. Mm. Like, you know, there's still, it's still a commercial entity at the end Very of the day. So. Um, I think a lot, a lot of businesses generally, I can probably speak more about financial services just because that's my expertise. Mm. but. You know, they really are just making, they have to, and they're making it all about the customer now, and mm. that's then driving and propelling them forward. I think any business that isn't looking at the customer first, customer centricity, like that's yep. the buzzword, yep. right? Um, and that's where all these challenges that you were just talking about are uh, you know, coming in because mm. they're just meeting the need of customers and they're just customer first, customer mm. focused. Um, they, could, they could always be doing more, but I do think, I, I don't know, I see businesses doing more and more mm. for good and, mm. and bigger businesses. I think the look, younger and more agile, streamlined companies, they've got an easier job. They don't have this traditional legacy systems of yeah. like 200 yeah. plus years. I mean, yeah. Australia is a baby, but you know, look at a country like the UK. So it's, it's, it's keeping the lights on, business as usual, and important. making all this digital transformation and change and sustainability and energy and la la la. Like and all the PR that comes around that because yeah. you, now you can't control that because it's out in the open. You, yeah. You, you, Anyone you can, can say anything about you. and United Airways, and, and they, they know about PR. Yeah. But are you seeing more, therefore, with the leaders that you speak to around philanthropy, uh, mm. philanthropy yeah. around what they're doing personally? Are they doing more in that regard rather than using their corporate vehicles? I think so, yeah. We have a big, like, there's a big CEO sleep out in Australia. I don't know if they have anything like that we here. Have Hopefully not in winter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But maybe it is in winter. It, is in it winter. should be, actually. It is actually in winter. Um, so, we, yeah, we have things like that. I think, um, as I was mentioning before, you know, a lot of the big organisations that I deal with, 
you know, have like diversity through the organisation. So that's true. A lot of the like philanthropic staff, um, some big business people in Australia are giving away, you know, stacks of money at the moment, which is mm. great to see. Um, a lot of, you know, programs for your staff to go through. Yep. Um, we do a lot of uh, charity work at RFI and we do a lot. We use our research yep. for charities. We work with the Cancer Council of, um, of Australia and things like that. So we personally do it. A lot of the business owners like and entrepreneurs that I get on Business Success on the Sky News show, mm. they certainly have um, a very uh, strong social philanthropic want to give back mm -hmm. a lot of their businesses are actually around giving back like that's how, what they've created a business to do yeah. which is always going to get great attention great pr it's doing good mm -hmm. I, I see a lot more business for good than i mean i guess my career has been in operation for mm -hmm. maybe sort of 14 ish 15 years which mm -hmm. makes me feel very old actually <laughs> but um <laughs> but like from that point to this point, like I think the GFC, I know it was obviously this terrible thing. It was probably the best thing that could have ever happened. Mm -hmm. It basically brought in, you know, a whole new like rules and regulation. You know, sp speaking to someone who works at a regulator for years and years, which is so funny and all of my banking clients are like, I think the FSA. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I believe in regulation. Yeah. I will, you know, I've got very strong morals and values and you my parents ra raised me like that. And mm -hmm. it's to protect the consumer mm -hmm. from themselves a lot of the time. Correct. And you know, don't just be lending out all this ridiculous amounts of money that people will never be able to give back and that's mm. where that's when it all sort of goes wrong so you know i think every cloud you know yep, every cloud has a silver lining and i think that it was probably something that needed to happen it was mm. probably always going to happen Correct. but really shifted and changed certainly since the gfc the financial yep. services industry has yep. cleaned up its act and you know responsible lending it's so important everything we're seeing coming in open banking psd2 everything that's happening in this country and yep. then globally yep. it's really interesting and it's for the good it's for the good of the consumer it's for the good of the economy for the good of the industry for the good of competition it's and pretty good survival exactly yeah so with rfi hat on now yeah what are some of the trends that you're seeing because obviously research is at the heart of what you're doing yeah what are some of the big in the financial world, what are some of the trends to look forward to that we should be aware of? So big trends, um, certainly this disruption piece by mm -hmm. fintechs, um, big trends in partnerships, so with traditional organisations, I know I said before about the leapfrog, but traditional organisations partnering with some fintechs um, to create you know, perfectly seamless yep. um, propositions. Yep. Payments is a massive space, which is, I mean, this is kind of the Uber, Airbnb and all mm -hmm. that, sort of mm -hmm. all of these platforms that, Payments globally is just where everything's at, and fintech would lie so strongly in the sort of that, payments. Yeah. I think you know it's like up around you know eight, it's, it's a three hundred to five hundred percent increase in sort of payment and digital only yeah. payment providers. I think at the moment another big theme that we're looking and sort of seeing part of me is trust. So trust in banking is quite interesting. So trust has always been the number one sort of asset class, if you like, in the banking and financial services mm -hmm. industry. It's always remained number one for the bank. So at the end of the day, you do actually trust your bank mm. because if you like drop your wallet mm. on the floor, Tim, and someone goes and spends some money, you call up your bank, they'll give you that money back. That's right. Like that's just what happens, right? Yep. A really interesting trend that we've seen recently is that technology companies are really starting to chip away at that trust. So mm. that's gone from 15 to 30%. Mm. The consumers now trust their technology company just the same amount. Millennials, that's up to 35%. Because they've grown up. With yeah, them. yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So you trust, like they trust, they trust, you know, technology companies to keep mm. their details secure. Facebook and Google have everything on us. They have way more than the banks have. I mean, think of some of the, my status updates back in 2008. Don't yeah. you want to think about it, what I'm I wrote. Not, I but I know I it's out there. I can't get rid of them, exactly. <laughs> I know it's out there. But so trust is a big one. So that's actually something really interesting for banks to watch that it's actually eroding for them as, mm. them, as that being their number one asset class. Mm. So they have to be a little bit careful now. Um, telecommunications companies, we kind of look at that space quite interestingly as trust in telcos is becoming mm. sort of greater and does that mean that banks and telcos will begin to partner or will telcos get banking licences? Something Maybe else that we look at. Yeah. Fintech, again, I mean that's just our probably massive area of interest at the mm. moment, just seeing what's happening. I oh, know, we, lo we, lo we love fintech. We, we, we were yeah. talking to a, a guy called Martin who's founded a business called Neighbour. What they do essentially is uh, provide loans to individuals based on their employer payrolls. Uh, they, they are raking in um, funders now because they're able to return the, the capital. But that whole disruption on a not very sexy element of business yeah. around payments or employee benefits, 
there is such a room, and I think you touched on it, around disruption, yeah. that the potential for these fintech companies to come in. My concern is always around the regulation that supports that, mm. but you've highlighted that as well. Well, they're being, I mean, they're being regulated, um, you know, they have to be regulated by the, and a lot of the, the challenger banks, Atom, Starling, Fidor, the German one, you know, they are getting, you know, banking licences mm. and it's and it's really kind of changing there. So I think that, um, yeah, I think, like fintechs are definitely, mm. you know, the one to watch. You were just mentioning an interesting company then, and there was a company, a guy I interviewed in Copenhagen last week at yeah. Money 2020. I just want to tell you this story because it's yeah. amazing. His name's Lionel Barros, I think is his surname, and it's Fomoco. Okay. And this is talk. This is about business and fintech for good, right? So he's created this wearable device for young girls in Africa, so school girls, mm -hmm. um, just for girls. Yeah. And they wear it, they go into their classroom and they tap in. Yeah. They attend the class and they tap out again and that gives their family food stamps. So for food, yeah. literally to eat. It yeah. actually gives me goosebumps, makes me yeah. a bit emotional. But one, it's brilliant those girls are getting a, an education. Mm. And two, it's an incentive for their parents to send them send to school. school. So it's yeah. an incentive to educate your daughters. Yeah. I'm actually getting goosebumps. But isn't that incredible? Like this European guy, I went and spoke to him afterwards. I just said, you are just an amazing mm person it's mm. being you know funded by the you know the government there as well and support but in in countries where you know we talk about unbanked and and you know this sort of cash issue and this is why I think I'm so passionate about this area is because you know this is this is people's lives Correct. It's education and financial literacy is literally where it begins it's so important I obviously am particularly interested in the girls but you know in any of these countries there was a, another woman I spoke to you know 70% of Vietnam in 70% of Vietnam is unbanked yeah so, so if you're unbanked, you you know you you just don't have rights to so many human basic human Correct. rights, and it's also it's it's your life. Like, you know, people get their arms chopped off for cash or for goods. Like, if you're being recognised by you know biotech or AI or every one of these cool things that you're actually it's actually pretty cool that mm. you're sort of seeing at the moment. Um, it literally is eliminating. It will never eliminate, but it will certainly come closer to eradicating, you know, crime and and I, I am quite passionate about that education piece, which is why I love that mm. for MoCo. I just think what a brilliant business model. Brilliant. It's important. Yeah. But if, I think you, 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 the bit there is, is that people, we take so many things for granted. Mm. To send your child to school would seem like an obvious thing for most mm. people in the Western world, but actually there might be more benefit for some of those parents to send them out to work exactly. or, or worse in yeah. some situations yeah, exactly. based on where they are. So Very good it, point. It, it highlights to us that there's a need. We, we, we talk about the unbanked. The, the, the problem we see is it's not just that you can't get access to be able to trade, but in some countries it's impractical to carry millions of pounds worth of dollars mm, in mm. a currency and then someone knock you on the head and just disappear yeah. and you've lost and everything. And it's gone. It's and gone. it's gone. And it's, and it's those, you know, and we're talking about, you know, rural completely, um, you know, third world Correct. kind of situations Correct. where this is happening. And so, you know, if people can start moving, this is why, you know, blockchain and everything is so important, you know, people can start moving money around mm. to, you know, family members, people working abroad. There's some great schemes in places like, you know, Singapore, there's great schemes for the, you know, the workers there and yep. then they send their money by, you know, by the sort of like the phone card. Phone card and that's, that's, right. well, that's awesome, you know, so their mum can go on buy dinner for everyone. Love it. I like that. I mean, that's why. It's the I, thing that makes you smile, isn't it's it? It's what makes me smile. And I think, you know, I've worked in banking finance for a long time and I, th I do, I'll be really honest with you, Tim, like for a while, I think I was a bit disillusioned of like, how did I get here? Like, how did mm. I go from being an actress to doing this? Because mm. I'm, you know, I love the arts, I love culture, all this mm. kind of stuff. And now it's just like the pennies just dropped and this stuff, like when I, when I hear, you know, see, CEOs of very big companies and banks standing up in front of 6,000 people in Copenhagen talking about things like this, I'm like, good, okay, this industry is actually, you know. It's moving. It's for good, yeah, yeah. for good, for the greater good of, yeah. you know, people's lives and, and for their, someone once said to me, a, a very senior a woman in banking in Australia once said to me, you know, she's like, you know, people always joke, are we the bankers? She's like, at the end of the day, your finances are the reason there is a roof over your head. It's the reason you can send your child to that school or not that school. It's the reason, it's you know, true. you can maybe buy them that little Christmas present that they really want. Mm. Or it's, you know, um, it's very easy to kind of sit there and go, oh, you know. Bash them. Bash banks yeah. and bash, you know, um, money. But, you know, money, it's a, you know. It's a people, necessary commodity. It's a necessary commodity. And, mm. and I think for, you know, some people obviously spurge and go crazy and need to go to Dubai and see that. But it's, I like seeing that people at very kind of more senior levels care about it. And I think this whole fintech and this whole new area coming in now, you see more and more people who actually want to sort of make a change. Love it. And you're one of those. Two final questions for sure. me. Sure. Where's your next destination? 
Uh, Singapore. Singapore. Yes, to see Very my godson. It's his birthday on Tuesday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. What's his name? His name's Lennox. Happy birthday, Lennox. And That's a cool name, right? Yeah, very cool. Um, great boxer. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> and final question, what was my rating out of 10? 11. Oh, you can come again. <laughs> <laughs> Chloe, it's been an absolute Thank pleasure. You. To Thanks, you. Tim. I loved safe it. Trip and we look forward to hearing how the RFI and everything else they're doing. And I would definitely tune into Sky News on other territories to see you in the future. Thanks so much. Thank you. Me. Thanks, Tim.